In the early days of photography, all you had were shades of grey. Every colour on the spectrum, from red to violet, was squashed down by the photographic process. And actually, early photographic film didn't even manage that. It used chemicals that were mostly sensitive to blue light. So if something was bright red, the chemicals would barely react to it. It would just look black on camera. Which is why dark rooms, where the photosensitive film was developed, could be lit with red light without ruining the pictures. It turned out that film like that would also react to X-rays. Now, visible light can pass through some solid objects, as anyone who's ever held their hand up to a light and looked at their veins can tell you, but X-rays with a higher energy and shorter wavelength pass through objects a lot more easily, so the picture doesn't get scattered into a blurry mess. So an X-ray photo takes those short wavelengths and translates them into something that our eyes can see. Unfortunately, that higher energy also means that X-rays are ionizing radiation. They come with a risk of cancer and radiation poisoning. Before that was known, fluoroscopes, which used a constant beam of X-rays, seemed like a great idea. Now they are very carefully controlled. But X-rays aren't just one wavelength. They're also on a spectrum from soft X-rays to hard X-rays. And there's a team here in Christchurch, New Zealand, who are doing something that, in hindsight, seems really obvious. What if you take X-rays at several different frequencies and then translate all those frequencies to different colours? The part of the light spectrum is the X-ray spectrum. And in there, we've got a range of energy. Sometimes they're called soft and hard X-rays. But the typical medical imaging device doesn't use that information. Sometimes it's used in airport security. They typically have a couple of detectors layers on top of each other and they get the, those crude signals out and, and then present it to the eye as two different colours. But we're actually getting eight different colours and we are doing a lot of computer processing before we get a 3D image of what the materials are. So we actually measure, you know, that's bone, that's water, that's fat. We started thinking about it myself in about 2002. The designers of the detector started 10 years before that it came out of high energy physics, it came out of CERN's research and trying to find the Higgs boson. Equally importantly, they found a much better way of imaging uh, inside humans than they had before. Each photon that comes in, we actually measure the energy of it. If photons come in so fast, it has to do it very, very quickly. The pixels are 110 micron square, so they're size of a hair's breadth, and each one of them is about three, three to 4,000 transistors. They're doing a lot of processing We've only got a two-dimensional image, so we've actually got to turn that into a three-dimensional image. And that's called computer tomography. We do a lot of computer processing and produce 3D slices any way through the object. With the resolution we've got, is we've got to solve tens of billions of equations, and we've got to try and do that very quickly. The goal is to make it as easy as possible for people to understand. For bone, you'd typically use white because that's what people think is what bone should be. But if you're looking at something like iodine, a solution of iodine is clear. So we are typically assign red, and most people in medicine are used to seeing things assigned to different colours. It's a combination of what looks good, what's intuitive, and what's easy to understand. We, we've got to the point we can now test things in humans, and we're about to start our first clinical trial. The challenges in going from where we were in 2006 on our first mouse to being able to do the first human, we had to move to the human energy range, so the x-rays you need to get through a mouse are much softer, lower energy, and we need to be able to do large areas of detectors so you can actually scan someone in a reasonable time frame. And then there's the data handling issues. Typically, we think of scanning one litre of volume giving us about 10 gigabytes of data. Can you actually scan a large object and, and manage that kind of data? At the moment, our scanner uses about half as many X-rays as a standard CT. Um, but if you think of imaging something like a wrist, which is not radiosensitive, it's not a thyroid gland, it's not a breast gland, the actual dose from a wrist scan is very, very low. Depending on which country you live in, it's the equivalent of several hours to a day or two of background radiation. Most X-ray detectors need to have a certain amount of photons before you can measure them, otherwise you're in the electronic noise. Whereas we work at very, very low count rates and so we can measure the statistical or the quantum noise quite easily. So we can operate at lower doses. Our goal is to keep the dose the same, but provide 10 times as much information. There are all sorts of different ways of looking inside the body. I'm really excited in the next six months, we're going to scan lots of interesting bits like broken arms and, and gout in the fingers. And maybe in a year's time, start looking at more exciting things like uh, 
uh, diseases of blocked arteries, we can actually say not just simply there's something absorbing, but whether it is calcium or iodine or fat. If it's an injury, is there a bit of metal in there or whatever? We can answer those questions. And so we've got a great prospect of, of actually seeing a lot of things that haven't been seen before. Thanks to all the team at Mars Bioimaging and the University of Canterbury. Pull down the description for more about them and about their work.